Okay, thanks, Bruce. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar this morning. This is our new webinar on um, as part of our Keep Teaching series that we are running this month. And uh, today's webinar is on learning how to map student workload for online activity assessment. Now, this is a new webinar. We have not run this before, so hopefully it will be something interesting for you. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, we know that, you know, as you continue to teach online and learn some strategies on remote teaching, you know, things tend to add up. And now we are in the mode of thinking of other things can we do? What variety can we add? It's now been a few weeks. Um, and definitely as we approach sort of the end of the semester, it's good to think ahead think and, you know, anticipate the end in mind so that we could have a better idea what students will be engaged in for the next three to four weeks. So today's focus is on mapping. Um, when we say mapping, you know, I wanted to kind of give you a visual of what the, the expected outcome should be if you were to take this home and do something like this. So we're using these tools um, to create a, sort of a course map so that you can anticipate or imagine would happen over the next four weeks or the rest of the semester. How can you apply this idea for the next course you teach in the summer if you're teaching online um, or if we go back to regular mode of teaching in the classroom, these ideas will still apply, you know? but it's um, a novel idea of using the tools to create a course map um, we won't be able to do the map today. We need a longer workshop for that. But today is to introduce you to the idea of how you could do it and what is it for. Okay. So um, if you go home, you would like to try to get post-its that have at least five to six colors. You could use one color and just use a marker to note the differences as well. But you know, the idea here is to represent certain activities for each color post-it. Have a space, wall, a desk, a table that you could map out several weeks. If you're not into that, you could map out several days, right? And you'll see some examples of that today. And then you'd need some markers and pens. So that's not um, as difficult to, um, to do, but if you don't have post-its on hand and you're not able to get anything, then you can just use um, and sort of use a table to create your map. So why do we need different colors, no? And why do we want to represent different colors? So we start with the idea that every learning event, whether it be an activity, assessment, um, that you plan for students, typically can be broken down into what we call learning elements. Okay? Learning elements are, it's almost like an anatomy of an, a learning event. So typically you would have for every learning activity instructions or communication about that activity. Right? You would have some kind of resources, which is the pink box um, that will support the activity. And then the green box, you would actually have the activity in mind planned. This could be an activity that is a practice activity or the activity could move into a more summative or assessment type of activity where you want to gather student evidence. So whatever that is, you know, it typically an activity would represent the green box. So sometimes when activities are done, there is conversation around the activity that happens between peers, between classmates, or between the teacher or even with the TA, if there's a TA in, um, in, the, in the picture. So there's dialogue that happens that engages in, that as the students engage in activities. Um, some literature on, on uh, you know, higher education learning would say that students even may create dialogue with themselves, like a self-dialogue, which is often a reflection on how am I doing um, as I do an activity. Right? It is a meta process or meta analysis that happens, um, a meta cognition that happens in the student as they go through 
several or a series of activities over time. And every activity always has the component of feedback, which is the yellow box, which comes in the form of a score um, or, a fee or some kind of um, a qualitative or feedback that given by the instructor. Okay, so again, no, this might be the first time you see this visual presented like this. So just to kind of recap this slide, um, every learning event um, that you will have students work on or comprises an activity. An activity often has some kind of communication, some resources to support it. And then the activity itself, whether it be summative or formative, an activity for practice or an assessment for evidence, which may allow a student to engage in some kind of dialogue with others or with their self or with the teacher, and eventually should have feedback, um, intentionally planned feedback. I want to encourage you to use the chat box now to just identify for me, I'm going to try to bring my chat box up. What have you been using so far as strategies for each of these? Feel free to put in any strategy for any of them. So if you have an idea of how you did communication, you know, just indicate communication and what you exactly. What resources have you given students so far? What activities are you using so far? What forms of dialogue are your students engaging in? Or are you engaging in? And what types of feedback have you been using in the past few weeks of going on remote teaching? So I'm going to bring up the chat window. If we could just take a minute or two to share these, and we could um, just have a look, have a look at them. Okay, my chat window is up. Okay, so I see Lucy's um, post, um, and I'd encourage at least one or two ideas on the chat. So let's look at them now. So um, for instructor communication, we see common ideas here of using announcements and um, you the way to communicate with students. Um, Paloma specifically also uses videos to communicate with students, which is a really good idea also. Um, Karen has noted that she uses an e-lesson for which is a narrated PowerPoint for communication. And maybe, Karen, your e-lesson also serves as an information resource for students, right? Because you're delivering new information or uh, explaining some content to them. Um, resources from Megan. There is a uh, weekly Dr. Smith's media. What is Rex, though? Uh, media recommendations. recommendations. So, so I find that, like, if students are able to, you know, watch uh listen to a pod like a freakonomics podcast about the changes in society like family structure the economy education due to covid then it's cementing the information that i'm teaching them in class wow that's that's a great idea so you're actually having uh having them sort of curate um, resources on this, on what's currently happening um and yeah, we've been updating them in a module on canvas every week and we put out links to those places. So, you know, before the COVID, it was like, you know, documentaries or shows like um, Little America on Apple TV that talked about immigrant experiences when we talked about global inequality, for example. Okay, thank you for sharing that. That's a great idea. Um, just looking through the list, you'll see that there's such a variety of uh, strategies being used. So you have Google Meets being used instead of WebEx, no? discussions as I, a ways to create dialogue, um, reflections as a way to get feedback from students or as a way for students to have self-dialogue um, and engage in self-dialogue. Um, as you go through the list, I'm just kind of skimming through. Um, we have WebEx meetings for office hours. That's a great way to have 
dialogue or communication with students and um, sort of you know having students sort of engage in different activities almost taps into you tend to tap into all of them right it should be that we tap into all of them as we give students activities that they need to work on so i have a slide that kind of um summarizes a lot of the of the um information presented but you know just compare what you are currently doing to what's on the slide and take a moment to see is there anything else that might be different that you could do or you could do or um do you kind of fall into the into this already so for example for communication it's very common to have email and announcements for resources you have articles powerpoint videos textbooks for practice and uh, assessment activities you might have assignments exams with this discussions reflections polls projects drills you know all kinds of forms of assessment and activities dialogue you might have students even doing things informally right what you see is typically them engaging in dialogue over a webex session with you or a consultation session with you but what you don't see possibly is that they are spending time with others on social media chatting about assignments outside of class outside of the formal space of canvas you know maybe they're using um, webex on their own maybe they're using zoom maybe they're using facebook so it's interesting that um, dialogue and practice tends to extend towards things that we do outside of the formal space of canvas because those are the things to process the work that we are required to do and feedback looking at the yellow box you know you have instructor feedback which can come in qualitative or a form like comments but you also have graded assignments peer review maybe external feedback and critiques from others so it's important just to think about these because when we start to map our course and map the elements of the course you want to sort of classify what you do in a certain post-it right so if you do a certain activity you need to be able to go back and say if i do discussion this falls as a dialogue if i do announcement loop instructor communication if i give students a textbook to read or chapter to read this represents as a pink information resource right the reason we do this is because we want to block the things we do to map them um, using using a table over time okay now let's try and see how this might work and i'm going to simulate a map for you so that you can go home and do this on your own hopefully at the end of this um send you some handout resources so you could have an example and you could use this to create one at home okay so let's just take an example, a very simple one. If we were online and we were to give students sort of a, a lesson to work on for the week, now you might have them watch a video um, and that is supported by a, a more formal content coming from a chapter activity, which is a practice assignment and then followed by a summative assessment at the end through a quiz. So we would use a mapping technique where you'd create a table, you know, maybe the whole week, Monday to Friday, and then you'd want to have the topic in mind, which is on the gray box, first gray box, and then you'd have a space for the workload expectation. And the important thing here is we want to map what the students are expected to do and how much time they would take. And that's how you would imagine workload, okay? So I have the pink, uh, I have the post-it uh, boxes at, on the top so that we could just remember the color coding that we are using. So you take your, your sort of outline of activities that you expect students to do, and you begin to create a space for them on when you think they're going to work on this over the week, right? So if the week begins on a Monday, you might expect that the students would get the information from you on a Monday or on a Sunday. You would map out that they would probably on the information pieces which is a youtube video and a reading earlier in the week and proceed with the activities and assessments after which is normal 
this is how we normally do it. So maybe the practice would happen on a Wednesday, and hopefully they will submit everything by Friday, which is when the deadline is. So if we were to put a time element to this, based on your expectations, now what your anticipated time for students' work should be, I'm adding a now a yellow box. Uh, so what's this? Yellow orange box. I'm adding. Let's call it orange. We're gonna add an orange box to to tag what's the expected time per element, right? So the YouTube video is 15 minutes. We'd say the YouTube is 15 minutes. It would take them maybe an hour to read one chapter, and then that's like you know in total that's um seven seventy five. And then there would be a practice activity which you anticipate them to work on for an hour, and then a quiz at the end which you'd anticipate them to work for an hour. In total, this expected work is three hours fifteen minutes. That you will see on the upper right. I have indicated the time that says three hours and fifteen minutes. Okay. Now, is this really what happens? Right. So. Now we want to take a step back and say, what's the reality of this? Right? So typically in an online class, this is not that all that students engage in. Right? In, um, environment, you would be sending announcements with the instructions, with additional things in the week. That would, that would require them additional time to review. So we'll add 15 minutes to that. So three hours, 15 now became three hours and 30. Right? What else? Of course, there is natural cases of distractions in this kind of situation we are in. The, um, the quarantine period that we are asked to work from home, learn from home, really requires us to do multiple things at the same time. We're balancing personal needs, you know, care for children, care for any elders if we have any, pets are around, just general things that need to be done at home. So there's tendency that things that we anticipate, which is a 15 minute video, really takes 30 minutes. Right? I, I'm changing items in red so you can see that there's modification to the time. And the tendency is that they the entire thing or have to review that again. So that extends to another 30 minutes on the next day. So our typical 3 hour 15 now became 4 hour 15, right? But possibly the same thing for the, ch the book chapter where it's not no, it's longer common in an online situation that students will do everything in one go. We have adult students who are very much responsible for many other things in this time. So there will have to be sort of an expectation that things are being done in smaller chunks and they're redone because when you do it the second time, you will have to sort of remember, what did I do again? Let me recall that. So that all takes time. So sometimes our expected time for workload is really almost doubled because there is learning time, processing time, interruption time that that kind of inter that kind of interferes and adds to the level of the time for learning. And possibly, what if they spend time discussing activities with others, right? So maybe it's it's a more challenging activity. They would seek some help. So they would engage with peers and the practice activity extends to another day because it needs more time. So now your three hours and 15 has become six hours and 15, right? So then they still try to submit it at the end, which is a 60 minute quiz because that might be a time quiz or something that's more formal. But just a simulation here that when you think about what students are doing in the week, we tend to think about in in per activity and we anticipate you know how much time they would spend on it and we predict a work in 15 but if you look at the reality we are in today where things are not what they are learning time is different work time is different um also their students and you and you perhaps as faculty are not yet very self-regulated to learn at home, right? These are, everybody is new to online learning and remote learning. So we need to anticipate that uh, students and faculty who are new to online learning 
often take more time to process and work through activities because they're learning how to regulate their time on their own. So my joke is, we used to say there's coursework and homework. When we go online, everything is homework. There's no difference. So all work is homework, right? So we account for that. And that's sort of the, the reason why I really advocate for the need to do some kind of mapping visually to really perhaps see what's happening. What is really happening? What may be something I'm not thinking of? So the opportunities for course mapping allows us to visualize how students learn. And we can use these tools like post-its and tables, drawings to create um, an accountability for things that are informal, like interruptions, distraction, maybe social learning and conversations with others. Taking into account that new students online may have a learning curve for navigating Canvas, maybe technology flaws, maybe internet issues, personal needs. So it's a very free form type of planning tool where it doesn't have to be always academic. You want to think of maybe people engaging in informal activities can add to their work that they do. So I encourage like, let's bring back the joy of course design because sometimes when we get caught up with all the things happening, um, we tend to forget how things fit together. Right? And it's time to think what do students really need to do with the time that they're spending on work at home, learning at home, do they need to do all of these activities or can we trim down, cut down to focus on only the essential activities that will be useful for this time and meet the learning goals? We use Marie Kondo's um, you know, expression of does this does your course still spark joy with students? And maybe play it's also it's a fun quarantine activity that might pass your time um, over the next few weeks. Okay, so we have a few more minutes. I'm gonna just walk through a second example before we end, because one is looking at things per day through a lesson view, but I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and look at things over several weeks. So for example, uh, we're gonna take an example of a final project that students will work on. Possibly that it will take them two, three weeks to work on this. Maybe there's a draft phase and then a submission phase and then a presentation that they need to work on later or you know, maybe as a finale to that, or an example of that. So we take this, using the same idea earlier, it looks a little simpler because I removed the, the, some of the components on top. Not looking at it per day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're looking at it per week. So your mapping looks a little different. So you project your milestones, right? So you have the first project, uh, for first project draft, which might take them one and a half hours to work on, your second project draft that's due on the second week might take them one and a half hours, hours to work. Then the final presentation, which is due on the last week of the semester or the week before the end of the semester, um, which might take them 30 minutes to present. So, you know, you map out first the expectation. How do you think, okay, what else do they need to do to get this project done? Right? And Remember what I said in the beginning that every activity typically has the other elements that, that support it. It's never really on its own. So if you think about not the things that they're expected to do, are they doing anything else to accomplish this? So maybe you have an announcement that week that triggers um, you know, the work that needs to be done with all the instructions they would likely have to go back to some kind of references to put to complete the project and that's sort of a review time to access resources um if there's ever a need to discuss the with others they would spend time doing that you know i'm no longer actually adding up the time because i get stressed just thinking about how much time this all takes for students so i'm just kind of mapping out now the elements right this is still simulated and i'm just giving an example it might not be the case for you but the idea is to just continually go into the practice of what else are they doing outside of the expected as activities how are they bringing in previous knowledge which is through the reading what are they doing with others so let's say this is week 13 and now they are able to complete a draft 
right? So then they would spend time in between work thir week 13 and 14 to work on milestone two. I call this work time. You know, if they might spend actual time to do the project, but they might have sort of a preparation time, a pre-thinking time, maybe data gathering, whatever they're doing to prepare for the final submission, revising maybe, right? And so that adds time. Maybe they you have another announcement that week, which is constant, like you constantly check in with them. So they go back and look at your announcement that pulls them back in. And then they might want to do a project consult to check before they submit. How's things going? Maybe they have to do to revise something that they didn't understand. Right. And again, adding work time to create the presentation that should be presented. Maybe the presentation is through a video presentation but they have to work on that right and then counting announcements and then at the end maybe you have feedback built in per phase right which accounts for your time to give feedback and their time to process feedback okay so counting also your time part of this my the point being there's a lot of things happening at the same time and if you really add up everything you will see that workload for students constantly increase and that in return also increases your work as faculty because you're the one who is also kind of planning all of this with them so it's really a partnership like a, a collaboration between you and the faculty uh, you and the student how much time you are dedicating to work and learning at home because of the expectations that are set okay, so this is an example now where it's kind of zoomed in per week previous one is an example where it's uh sorry this is zoomed out per week and the and the example is where you're zoomed in per day okay, so you, you know it's up to you how you feel like where your gap is what your challenge is why are you even thinking of attending this workshop for mapping now if maybe you take the opportunity this weekend to take uh to practice doing some kind of a uh, prototyping of predicting how much time your students will spend on an activity that you have planned in the upcoming week. And that's sort of the purpose of the workshop to, of the webinar today, to encourage you to do this type of thinking on your own. And, you know, um, hopefully if you get any, any Eureka moments that might impact the way that you design assessments and projects for the rest of the semester, as well as for the upcoming semester. So that ends my, um, webinar today. Um, we have a few minutes. If anybody has questions, I can look at the chat or you could go um, unmute and go ahead and ask. We'll be happy to answer. And Bruce um, on the call who is uh,